Welcome. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jim Black, uh, Chair of the Business Economics Department here at Johnson State College. And it is our sincere pleasure to be able to host this event tonight with the uh, Vermont Futures Project. I want to say one thing. We have a new president, and she is magnificent. And I'd like to introduce her, uh, Dr. Elaine Collins. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the faculty and staff at Johnson State College, I'd like to welcome you to the Public Forum on Vermont's Future. This event is co-sponsored by a number of organizations, including the Lamoille Economic Development Corporation, Lamoille Region Chamber of Commerce, and Lamoille County Planning Commission, as well as Johnson State College. Let's give all of these organizations a round of applause for having the foresight. to convene such an important event on Vermont's economic future. The Vermont's Futures Project was founded to conduct research and provide knowledge about Vermont economy for the purposes of enhancing and sustaining a robust and growing economy. In past months, data were presented and published in three broad areas, economic performance, workforce, and quality of place. This evening, we will be working on creating a collective vision about the economy that we want as Vermonters. This vision will be informed by Vermont values, a strong tradition of hard work, and the needs of future generations. Clearly, we have a lot of assets in Vermont. And from my vantage point as the new president, I believe that education, as well as quality of place, are two major strengths from which to build. But I wonder sometimes if these strengths alone will sustain all that Vermont has to offer. As we move into the future, sustainability, in my opinion, will become the new metric for competitiveness. I ask myself, are our organizations ultimately sustainable? Is our region sustainable? And is our state sustainable? Sustainability will not only depend on our ability to make responsible fiscal decisions, but also the degree to which we limit our environmental footprint as a result of human activity and also enhance our social systems. It's going to be a fine balance across economic prosperity, environmental stewardship, and socially conscious innovation. This promises to be a very interesting and productive meet evening, so let's get started. At this time, Professor Black will introduce you to our main speaker, Jeff Lewis. Thank you. Okay, so for the final exam, you have to remember her name. It's Elaine Collins. You can't leave the room until you get it right. Shake her hand. She's truly a magnificent president, and we're so happy you're here. Thank you. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Jeff Lewis, and he's the guy that will run the whole night. I'm just going to sit down and be quiet. Jeff, the podium is all yours. Cool. Now, if you applaud before, that means I get to go home. So you might want to hold that until we're a little further along. Uh, as I said, my, thank you, President Collins. I really appreciate that. Well said and well summarized. Uh, my name is Jeff Lewis. For, the, for 10 years, or about eight years, I was the executive director of the Regional Development Corporation in southeastern Vermont, BDCC. Uh, during that time, we founded a, a, a parallel economic development organization to do strategy, build our own SED, start to focus on workforce, called SEVEDS, the Southeastern Vermont Economic Development Strategies Group, still functioning. I retired from there about two and a half years ago and got involved in this about a year ago. So retirement has eluded me as a practice. The Vermont Futures Project is, is a project of the Vermont Chamber Foundation, which is a 501c3 created by the Vermont Chamber of Commerce specifically for the purpose of paying attention, as President Collins said, to the health and vitality of the Vermont economy. It is based on work having been done by other chamber foundations, for instance, in North Carolina, Kentucky, and Florida, have, have done the same kind of research-based, strategy-driven uh, projects to help drive economic development and growth in their states. It was specifically created 
because in Vermont, as in New Hampshire, but as the only two states in the country, we have a two-year government cycle because of the gubernatorial elections, which causes attention to be relatively short-focused because elections follow one another so quickly. Consequently, it's very difficult to pay attention to long-term trends, develop long-term strategies, and pay attention to stuff for over the long haul. Therefore, one of, the, one of the real features or functions of this uh, project is to build something that can pay attention to the quality and health of the economy over the long term. And by long term, we mean 10 to 20 years. It's taken us a long time to get to this condition. It's going to take us a long time to come out of it. And we'll talk about a little bit of that data, some of which I hope you may have looked at already. So we do want to say that economic development, which is our primary function, is about working to improve the quality of life for all Vermonters. So if you keep that in mind, our goal is to improve the quality of life for all Vermonters. There's a three-phase project that we're engaged in. The first, as President Collins said, is to uh, edit and collect data, which we published on a website named vtfuturesproject.org. There's about 90 economic indicators there. Uh, that are sugared down to about 30 key indicators that you'll see a little bit later. Second phase, which we are in now, is to, building on that data, is to create a vision for the Vermont economy. And we're going to talk about this notion of vision quite a bit tonight because Vermonters, as somebody reminded me this afternoon, are practical people. They are used to picking up a wrench and fixing stuff. What they're not used to doing, it turns out, is thinking about what they'd like to see, is thinking about what could be. They're used to getting through the day, not thinking about next week or next year or 10 years from now. We're going to start to talk now in, this, in our project about what do we want Vermont to be? What is success? What is success in economic development and in a healthy economy? What does it mean for people to have opportunity, and choices. What do, how, does, how do we experience that? So we're going to talk about what vision is and how to get there. Phase three, however, because vision, powerful as it is, is not enough. We're going to talk in phase three by taking the vision based on the data, because the data tells us what reality is, and develop public policy based on those two things. So we actually intend to build a kind of virtual public policy institute around economic activity and development. We want to learn what are best practices. We want to educate policymakers and opinion leaders across the state on what are, what are good things to undertake so that when legislators sit around the committee room table, they have some broader experience than what they, than what they have brought before. They have some knowledge. They have some people to turn to. They have folks they've worked with on these topics. So we want to improve the conversation. So the question is, how did vision become part of economic development? And it's because we need to think about something bigger than ourselves. This is essential to being human. So we need to look beyond ourselves, to think about something bigger than what we want, but what's good for our community, or in this case, our state. We need a way to share values and goals. But not just what do I want, but what do I need? What's important to me and what's important to my community? Those are the kinds of values that we need to talk about. They need to show up in the vision that we build so that the Vermont we have in 20 years embodies the values that are crucial to what makes Vermont itself. Also, just speaking as a person who did a little bit of sailing as a kid, we steer by where we want to go to, not by where we've been. You don't look at the wake of your boat to know what you're doing, you look ahead. So vision tells us where do we want to go. It gives us a reason to go somewhere, a reason to get up and work, a sense of what we're trying to accomplish. Frankly, we'll work harder for something we believe in than for something we feel we have to do. 
We hope to build something that we can all believe in. And this is the phrase that we will continue to use. We need to know what success looks like. We know what it looks like when things don't work. We know how to find and identify problems. As I said, Vermonters are wrench people. They know how to find problems and how to go at them. We need to know what success looks like. So let me talk a little bit about a concept that uh, Jennifer, my business partner, who's unfortunately doing some, not unfortunately, but she's doing some family things tonight. Uh, so I forgot to introduce my associate, R.T. Brown, who works for BDCC, is helping me tonight. Uh, let me talk about the policy marketplace. In the public policy arena, in states and in regions and in communities, there are, there are usually three sets of values or interests that are at play. One is the environmental movement, which is about conservation, protection, preservation. What, is our, what do our surroundings look like? What are we doing with our natural resources? In Vermont, this group is well organized and well funded, it's articulate, and it's been successful, thank heavens. We are proud of our environmental heritage and what we, what we have built and what we want to keep in it. Groups like VNRC, Vermont Land Trust, Conservation Law Foundation, and many others are well organized and devoted to keeping that alive and keeping it articulate. Second group, social and economic justice, has to do with how we distribute resources amongst people. What do we do with those who have less? What do we do with those who are challenged? What do we do with health care issues, access to education, affordable housing? Our housing organizations, the Public Assets Institute, people interested in single-payer health care, the Vermont Workers Center, are all organizations that, are, that are, work in that area. Also, in Vermont, the vision around social justice is relatively clear. The other corner is what we call economic development or economic opportunity. The RDCs, Chambers of Commerce, some industry organizations pay attention to that. There are some connections between these. They interact with one another in the public policy arena. Policymakers are always trying to balance in budget and policy, in regulation, in practice, how these get represented. Now, each of these is represented somewhat differently by various advocacy groups, of course, who are present, who have more or less clearly articulated goals. There are conflicts that develop. I won't go into those, but there are conflicts that develop in each one of these sets of relationships that are sort of indigenous. If you, you go to the legislature, you will hear some of the same discussions year after year because some of the conflicts between social justice people and environmental people are real and long lasting. They have to do with what do we do with resources? Do we extract more tax revenue and give it to people? Or do we use it to acquire and protect land? That's a constant and continuing policy budget and discussion. Very real. In Vermont, and this is, this is now where the policy marketplace becomes more specific to Vermont. Here, there is, as I've been saying, a relatively clear environmental vision. Most of you would know what that was. What we want to do, we want to preserve our ridge lines, we want to keep the place safe, we want clean water, we want to keep prime ag land, et cetera, and so forth. It's a fairly clear vision. Not all these groups agree all the time about every detail, but there's a, there's a broad vision about what we want the environment to be like. Similarly, there's an emerging vision around social justice. This has the sense of fairness has been powerful in Vermont for 50 years or more. And it's, it's, it's achieving greater clarity in terms of the policies that are needed to support that. The current governor, for instance, his, his interest between these two tilts more in this direction, so there's been more effort here. Things like single pair of health care, et cetera, have achieved a sort of currency and clarity that they did not have. So there's an emerging vision of fairness and what that means in Vermont. These are pretty clear. In fact, if you walk in the legislature and ask people, 
what's our social, social justice vision, people can tell you. Whether or not they agree with it, they can tell you what it's out, what's out there. Now we can talk about details of implementation and policy differences, but those visions are pretty clear. This one isn't. If you walk in the legislature and ask people what the economic vision is for Vermont, it's not as clear. People don't know. In fact, some will actually tell you that the economic vision is to keep more land preserved and protected because that somehow will make us more successful. Or, and I've had people say this and you probably have, their economic vision is, you know, if we had single pair of health care, everything would be fine. That doesn't have much to do with opportunity. It has to do with access to resources. It doesn't have much to do with opportunity or the ability to control and manage your own life and make it what you want it to be. So the reason I draw this picture is that this is why we're here. We are here to build this vision and make it real and begin to develop the people who own it so that when the legislature meets, there's a sense of what this vision ought to be. I do not pretend we'll finish that tonight. We're having 10 of these meetings around the state. And then we plan to spend the next few years doing the policy research necessary to give this real body. But this is what we have to build. A vision and a constituency of interested people who say, yes, that's the vision of opportunity that I think Vermont needs. That's what success looks like. That doesn't mean you win every battle. There's still other policy areas that you have to negotiate with and work with. But this one has to assume its place at the table, and that's our job tonight. One of the things we look at <clears throat> as an illustration that some of this structure isn't quite as robust as it needs to be is that we see a lot of deals going on. Some of you who are developers or work in the permit area know that the permit process in Vermont is awkward, sometimes difficult, impossible. Worse, sometimes it's accessible to making offers. Say, well, how about if we do it this way? Or how about if instead of doing that, how about if we talk about a new fire department uh, building for the town? Suddenly we have a condition to permit. So deals get made. We know of a situation in which a company was trying to expand its physical facility to bring in more equipment, could not get the necessary permitting to build it. Partway through the process, somebody who seemed to come out of this point of view said, you know, this was just a phone call, said, you know, if you could promise to hire 50 more people, we could support your permit application. So here's the problem. The company trying to build this is in a productivity business. The manager's job is not to hire people. It is, in fact, not to hire people. It is to increase efficiency and effectiveness. So agreeing to hire 50 more people was exactly counter to her business mission. It's not an agreement she could make. But somebody made that offer, misunderstanding what the business did and thinking also that they could extract something from that process. Those are the kinds of deals that go on. Now, deals happen everywhere. And they're, gonna, they're going to, I can't, can't, that's the way life is. But as we see a number of them occurring, particularly around land use, we begin to suspect that our permit and land use policies are not quite as robust and useful as they need to be. So when we talk about the economy and public policy, it's important to know that while people sometimes say in that vision of the economy, in, that in Vermont in particular, I, and I hear this, I don't understand the economy, but I don't have to. It'll just go and do what it's going to do. But that's not true. An economy is 
and economic activity is affected very directly and really by public policy. And you can think of some offhand without even spending any time on tax policy, employment policy, minimum wages, land use. Where can you build what? What's the transportation like? What is the infrastructure in terms of roads and water and wastewater? Those public policy choices affect what happens economically. So the economy is tightly tied to public policy. And public policy is tightly tied to the economy because ineffective policy damages an economy and drives its productivity and outputs down, which reduces revenue, which tightens the state and makes it less capable of doing the things it wants to do. Government has resources as well, particularly state government. It has resources of money, advice, support, and power. If the state government puts its shoulder to the wheel, things can happen. We've seen this happen in Brattleboro. GS Precision threatened to move to New Hampshire, which isn't very far. And the state, meaning the governor, Agency of Commerce and Community Development, VITA, put their shoulder to the wheel, working with BDCC, and put together a package of financing and, and incentives that kept GS Precision and its 300 plus highly paid employees in Brattleboro. Government has capability and power. They can make things happen. And we have to remember that. And government has to remember that it has that power. These are some of the things that it can do. You, could, you know all those. Economies grow when populations grow. More people means more workers, means more consumption. Economies get bigger. Wealth grows when productivity increases. That is, when you get more dollars of value for an hour of input. And productivity grows when we get smarter, when we know how to harness innovation, we know how to, how to invent and use capital resources like machinery, software, data. But productivity is crucial, crucial to growing economies. So now we start looking at the data. Vermont's workforce and, and population are stagnant and have been for 10 years or more. The, the workforce of Vermont has not grown for almost 15 years. It's about 320,000 people. It's been about 320 for 15 years. We don't have any more hands on the plow than we did. Economies don't grow or don't grow much if you don't have more workers. Worse, and I'll talk more about this a little later, but you can, you can hear about it now. Worse, a lot of those are the same people they were 10 years ago. So what are they now? 10 years older. When I walk around the floor at GS Precision, which is an, a, a high precision manufacturing facility, does aerospace and medical things, what do I see? I see a lot of gray haired machinists who've been working there for 25 years. And they're loyal. The company's loyal to them. They are paid well. They are treated well. They love working there. But they're 55. And they don't intend to continue to work standing on their feet, running a machine for 20 more years. I know from talking to people in the Northeast Kingdom that there are companies in the Northeast Kingdom that cannot see GS has this problem. Northeast cannot see where the next set of employees is coming from. So they're starting to make plans about how do, they, how do they ramp their company down because they don't see any way forward. When this workforce ages out, they think they're done. That's desperate. That's desperate. That's that means losing employment. Losing employment. That's the workforce. Productivity. As I said, productivity is the secret to wealth creation. Getting more, creating more per hour of labor. Vermont's productivity is below the US average. It has been. We are not ahead of the curve. We are behind the curve. We think 
that this is because we are in our industry mix, we have a high percentage of what we call labor intensive or low leverage industries, healthcare, education, retail and tourism kinds of things, government. God bless them all, but these are people businesses. If you want more patients in your hospital, you need more nurses and LPNs and LPAs. You can't hire a robot, you need more people. If you open another store in Stowe, you don't hire another robot, you need people to keep it open. These are labor driven. Productivity is hard to find in those. But that's our industrial mix, so we have to know that and we have to work to it. Once again, the term long term shows up. These are long term challenges. The workforce has been the same count wise for 15 years and it's had many of the same people in it for 15 years. Changing that is not something we're going to do tomorrow. It's not as though this is a new issue. Vermont's been thinking about itself for 85 years. I bring these every time because I like to. This is the book that was published in 1931. It's called Rural Vermont, a Program for the Future. Published by a group, as it says, of 200 Vermonters who spent a year and a half thinking about the future of Vermont, particularly its agricultural future, obviously in 1930. But this was the first time they really sat down to think about who are we and what do we want to be. Now the bad news is it was done by the Department of Eugenics at UVM. But it's still not a bad piece of work and fascinating. Those, this is, well, we're far upstate now, but Grafton conferences used to be held at Grafton Inn under the auspices of the Wyndham Foundation starting in 1984 when Stephen Morris, who had been the Speaker of the House, became the President of the Wyndham Foundation, founded the Grafton conferences to pay attention to public policy. The first Grafton conference in 1984 was on economic development and the environment of Vermont. And if you read this, you would think it was written yesterday. We are still discussing the same issues and we haven't resolved them. Meaning they're still important issues, they're still current, but we're still wrestling with them. So, but we've been at it. We've been working at this. That's the important message. I brought some other stuff over there, including, this goes before you, I think. This is Vision and Change, which was actually written during the administration of Philip Hoff. Same thing, 1968, what's Vermont gonna be and how are we gonna get there? So we've been at this for a long time and we still aren't there. We still don't really quite know what we wanna be and how we wanna get there. Some trends have been, been the same. Always talked about land and the environment since 1931. <clears throat> Increasing focus on fairness, social justice, the notion of small towns and how we get along together is crucial. However, in none of them has there been attention to opportunity, what it means to individual Vermonters to have choices, to have the ability to grow, to live, to live well and to live better. So why are things not better? We were just chatting about this. Simply put, and this is my interpretation, I was pleased to hear that somebody with more experience than I actually thinks pretty much the same. In the rapid growth of the 70s and 80s, I don't know how many of you remember that, but Vermont's population went like this from 70 to 90, with a vast influx of what we now fondly call flatlanders, who brought their education, in some cases their trust funds, but certainly their interests and their energy to Vermont because it was new and different. It was a back to the land movement that motivated them to leave cities and come up here. And the reason we have this in 1984 is that scared the crap out of Vermonters because the place was growing too fast and it felt like we were losing control and it was no longer Vermont. So one of the things we did was we put in place some things to help control growth. Land use policies, 
some planning goals, some attitudes. And the bad news is they worked. We stopped growing. So around the middle 90s, growth began to slow down, and by 2000 or so, it flattened out, and we stopped. What we've missed is that lifestyle preferences have changed. The back to the land movement has completely reversed, not only here but across the globe, to massive urbanization. Kids are from Vermont are leaving to Boston, New York, Washington, Philadelphia, Chicago, San Francisco, because cities are where things are happening. Here, Europe, Asia. And we have not adjusted Vermont's values to accommodate that. We still think the land is the primary value. And our environment is important to us. It needs to be. But it doesn't have the attractive value it did 30 years ago. Every other rural state in the country has similar challenges. Sit around in Iowa, you'll have the same discussion about people leaving the farm and going to the city. Go to Maine, it's even worse than in, in Vermont. There are parts of Maine, I go to Maine in the summers, there are parts of Maine you drive through and see things I don't see here in Vermont. I see vacant houses, not just vacant old houses, vacant relatively new houses that people just walked away from because they could no longer make it there. So they just left. I see towns that make our small towns look like metropolises. Go to down east Maine, out beyond Ellsworth, those are really remote, rural villages without much going on. That's hard scrabble living. So my point is that Vermont did not change its vision, and that's why we're here, is to adjust, change, and grow the vision for what success means in Vermont. From being the goal of urban people in the 70s and 80s, what can we be now in the 2010s and 20s and 30s? We have built mental models of Vermont, but the data that we have challenges us to look at that reality. We want Vermont to be green, environmentally strong. We want it to be fair. Those are great values. The data says that at the same time we are not growing, in terms of raw numbers, our, our productivity is below the US average, our wages are low in the region, we are aging, young people are not coming, they are leaving. That data says that those mental models, those visions, are no longer current. We need to do something different. Why now? If I've got books from 1931 until today that have paid attention to this, why now? Why do it again? First of all, because we have to. It would be irresponsible not to. We have to look forward. But it's also because the tipping point is visible now in the data on our website and that hopefully you've seen in other places. The bubble of population of workforce in their 50s is going to retire in 10 to 15 years. That is not deniable. There are those of us who are over 70 who are still working. The bad news in Vermont is that almost everybody who's over 70 who wants to work is working. There is no hidden reserve of people, older people who can go back into the workforce. They're already there. So the tipping point is visible. So when the workforce wears out, it wears out. But we've got, we've got 10 years. We've got time. Not much, but we've got time to get at that. The state budget, and our legislators are not here because they're in, they're in Montpelier working on this right now. What they refer to as the alligator mouth between expenses and revenue every year for the past five years has been 50 to $100 million because the expenses are rising faster than the revenue. At some point, you run out of fixes. You run out of dimes and nickels and little taxes you can add. 
some point, you have to address the issue of growing the bottom line, of making the economy stronger, increasing productivity and general revenue. And if we don't solve this, the challenge to Vermont's quality of life that we treasure and value could be devastating and precipitous. When there stops being enough money, it may stop quite quickly. And then we're North Dakota. When the oil stops, when the oil price drops, and suddenly there's nothing. So the usual conversation about Vermont's economy is about forecast, doom and gloom. I've just given you a bunch of that, but you all knew that before you got here, so nobody's crying as I can see it. Of course, the lights don't glint quite right on the tears, but uh, we've done this, we've done this. We know how to develop strategies, sectors that are valuable, how to, what we want to do. So let's talk about the Futures Project and what it contributes to this. Let me be quick about this part. Three things are in the data that we share with you. One is baseline data. There's about 80 or 90 indicators in there, and I'll show you one in a second. Second, there's a dashboard of 30 uh, what, we, what we call actual economic indicators that we think if these move, the economy moves, you'll get a copy of those, or you have a copy, actually. And this is how we this is how we track progress on those indicators. This is a piece of raw data. This is the distribution of workforce by age and county in the state. Guess what the big one is? Ah, let me guess. Chittenden County. Yep. But if you look carefully at this, you'll see it's proportion of greens, that's 45 and up, in the counties other than Chittenden are much larger. In other words, Burlington's doing okay. Not great, but okay. The rest of the state, pretty challenged. Southern Vermont in particular, Bennington and, and uh, Wyndham counties, are really quite damaged. There's too many of us old people and not enough young people. That's why we're glad RT came to town. He averages me out. The indicators lead to a dashboard. We have six indicators. The economy, innovation and entrepreneurship, workforce, demographics, total demographics, quality of place and infrastructure. Those, those little dials are not just decoration. The board, the Vermont Futures Project board, actually talked about these for quite a long period of time to decide where to locate those. And there was there was back and forth about, no, nah, we're, we're, we're stronger there than you think. No, you forget this. And we had quite a, quite a time trying to set those where they, made, where they made a difference, where they were illustrative and pointed. The scary part is that the two red ones are in workforce and people. And that the economy, the overall economy, is in the yellow. That's because of that productivity number because our growing sectors are labor-intensive, low-productivity ones. It's not manufacturing, although we got 13% manufacturing workforce in the state, which is terrific, and they're great companies. We have an enormous number of healthcare workers. Our hospitals are growing. But they don't add productivity, they don't add wealth. So that's a worry. We think our entrepreneurial and innovative indicators are actually pretty good. We have really good on, um, entrepreneurship numbers here. There's 50% five-year business survival in Vermont. It's one of the best in the country, sixth best, I think, in the country. Excellent. We do a great job starting and supporting new companies. We have some really innovative operating companies, GW Plastics, GS Precision, Concept2. You guys can name more than I know. So we have that. What we don't have, what we, what we don't have is people to work in them. 
We think the quality of place is really good. I think everybody agrees with that, but there are pretty significant challenges, which are infrastructure challenges, road quality, bridges, uh, water and wastewater supply, power. With the closing of VY, we don't generate very much power, we buy it. We're making more by solar and wind, but it's not enough yet, even though our goals are high for 2050. That's a challenge, it's a big challenge. These are the indicators. These are the numbers that we think have to move for, the, for things to be better. This one is red. This is the unemployment rates, 3.7%. And you all know by now that that's a bad number, not a good number. Because what it means is there aren't enough workers available for people to hire from. I don't know how many people, have, how many of you hire, but I, if you do, I suspect you have found that it is very hard to find the quality and number of people that you need to make your business be successful. So, out of the baseline and dashboard indicator number, there we go. Whoops, you want one, there we go. Darn thing, I know. It's like a race car. Out of these, we want to knit this. We want to create a vision for what does success look like for Vermont. No, we can go ahead. So the, there are three, I said there were six pillars, but out of the six pillars, we have, we have three key groups of indicators that we talk about as chunks. One has to do with the economy, which is driven by, by uh, innovation, as Schumpeter said, the creative destruction. This is how uh, this is how economies change, is by new innovation, creativity, by new products replacing old products, by new companies replacing old companies, by new technology replacing old technology, by efficiency growing. Workforce is clearly shaped by demographics. If the people don't live here, they can't work here. Even though, by the way, we're, we're importing a large number of people along our borders from New York, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire who drive in every day and drive home at night because they can't find a place to live here. And finally, places are powered by infrastructure. The way we build our roads, how we distribute broadband, how we distribute wastewater, water supplies, matter. Those makes, make places habitable and developable. Let's go back and look at Workforce. Let me talk now a second about workforce supply. And this is a, there's a project we're doing uh, with Johnson State with Jim's class. And in fact, the guys who are running it are sitting in the back right there, Pedro and Ricky. Or Pedro's running it, Ricky's helping, right? Yeah. Uh, we spend a lot of time in Vermont, and we have over the last let's see, six plus eight is 14 years, talking about the workforce shortage. And we've had some really great programs about how do we retain college students? How do we help a few people maybe buy their first house in Vermont? So I did this on the back of an envelope one day to try and figure out if those were gonna solve the problem. And the answer, as you can see at the bottom of the page is, no. What I did was try and account for number of people retiring, growing the workforce to get to what we will call full employment, which is about 4.9 percent, building in a little bit of growth, going over the top here, but a little bit of growth, migration replacement people who leave and come and go, turnover. Then what do we have for supply? We have high school graduates, some of whom will go into the workforce because they don't go to college. Hopefully they'll go into the workforce. Youth unemployment, by the way, in Vermont is very high, so we're not doing a good job of getting those kids into work. We, we have kids who go to, kid, Vermont kids who go to college, some in state and some out of state. Hopefully we'll retain some of them. We have 40,000 college students in the state. Hopefully we'll keep some of them. Many of those are from out of state. Can we keep some of them in Vermont? So we try and take account of that. We try and take account of former Vermonters, people who are just plain coming back because they love the place. 
and we still need 12,000 people a year. That's new people, new workers a year, 12,000. Twelve thousand. Do you know how many building permits were issued in Vermont last year? Fifteen hundred. Let me see. Fifteen hundred building permits, twelve thousand people. Ten people per, per unit. Not bad. Something doesn't match. Something doesn't match. By the way, of the 1,500 units, we don't even know how many of those were actually built. Those were merely permits that were pulled. Some of those projects didn't get done because of the permitting process that follows that is kind of difficult. So this is the scale of the challenge that we have to face. It is non-trivial, as we say in math. This is a hard problem. We have to get those people here. We have to house them. We have to provide towns that they can live in or be integrated into and enjoy the Vermont life. Move to Morrisville or Morristown or Johnson or Hyde Park or Williston or Essex or Brattleboro. And those towns have to welcome these people. Say, we're glad you're here. Come and be part of our life. So the assumptions for today's work. That the economy matters and deserves our attention and that our attention is worth giving to it, that we can change it, we can affect it by public policy, that we can make it, that we can affect public policy and make a difference in the economy, that a successful economy actually help, can help to advance our social and environmental values because that's what we want it to do. A successful economy does not have to mean that we pave everything from here to Montpelier. We want to see increasing opportunity for Vermonters, or as I say, we want people to be able to live, to live well, and to live better, according to their own lights. If that means living in an off-the-grid hut on the side of a mountain, fine. If it means working at a software job in Burlington, great. And the economy is complex, which is good. We think a diverse economy is, in fact, one of the great strengths of Vermont. All right, let's talk about the actual work today. There's a form you've got. Um, I don't even know if I've got a sample of it. It has six boxes on it with three, uh, three down the left-hand side, which are economy, workforce, and quality of life, quality of place. And across the top are the three things I want to talk about. One of them is futuring. Futuring is not visioning. Futuring is starting where we are, thinking about the problems and how do we solve them. This is the wrench work. The tractor doesn't work, get the wrench out, take this off, make new one of those, put it back on. That's futuring. The bridge work is, I figured out what a problem was, why does that give me some hope for the future if I can solve that, that's good. But the third thing is visioning. Visioning is, what does success look like? What do I want this to be? Now, you can't take leave of reality. I said this data here. And we've given a lot of that out. You've got the indicators with you. What does visioning mean? What is the vision? But we're trying to get to there. Now, what are the problems today? Turn that problem inside out. What happens if I solve this problem? What happens if I have enough workforce? Oh, there's a vision. We have enough workforce because young people are coming to school here and staying in Vermont because we have opportunity, because we have a great relationship between our colleges and our employers. The colleges know what the employers want. The employers know what the colleges can do. They're present. They employ the kids as interns and apprentices. Everybody has a, has a tight relationship. People have opportunities. They may choose not to take them, but they have them. That's vision. So what we're trying to teach ourselves today, as I said at the very beginning, is how to vision. So we're going to have you do this, because we know everybody starts with the problems. So do that now. 
I'm, we're going to do one thing first, and then we'll go, then when we get into our groups, we'll talk about vision. So you can think about that now. So here's what I want you to do. We're going to work in three groups. We're going to work on one group on the economy, uh, one group on workforce and demographics, and one on quality of place and infrastructure. So what I would like you to do is count off by threes, one, two, three. That'll be the ones on the economy. Twos will be on workforce and demographics. Three will be on infrastructure. If you do that now, when you start working on the form you've got to work on, you'll know which one of those rows to pay the most attention to. I heard good ideas coming out of her and I heard really good engagement and discussion. How, did, how were those discussions? Did people feel like you came up with stuff, that you were grappling with the right problems? Or did you feel like the whole thing was way too complicated and we ought to just go home and take a nap? <laughs> if you're going to do more of these, you might want to structure it a little differently, like for some more time for discussion. I mean, it was crammed up and we yep. all had to sort of get polarized yep. and that, that really wasn't my Okay. I talk too much, in other words. I met that <laughs> And Jennifer would have told me the same thing, but she's not here, so I got to do what I wanted. I think, and I, I'm going to just echo something, yeah. that it's a great opportunity to have a conversation, and it, it feels, you know, we're coming up with these really quick, pithy, you know, resolutions that don't feel like resolution, and that I hope that that, is not, that doesn't become the product of this discussion, that there is an opportunity to really get into more depth. Um, now that we have an understanding of what it is that you're presenting, is to have a real conversation about it. Because you can't do that this quickly. Thank you. So That's you good. would do this something like this again at some way greater length. We were, well, to be honest with you, yeah. I understand. We were trying to balance time commitment availability, location, and maybe we're too short on time, not because we're not able to allow enough engagement, so. Jeff? Jeff? Or you're also saying that a second cut at it, you get wiser the second time you go at it, right? So if we had another conversation in a month or two, you'd be smarter, because you've done less, it. less presentation, more just dialogue with a community that's quite intelligent and experienced on it. Decisions, but just there's a lot of power in this room. I'd like to hear from the room. Okay, good point. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful to me. Our, so what we've written down, uh, the sheets that were collected, are you extrapolating the data into me metrics or how are you going to work with that? And how do you know who it's representing? I mean, how do you work with the information? Same as we, we've got, just got statements here. We don't know who said them, so we. We take those as contributions of vision, so. What I'm saying is there's an automatic skew built in? Of course, but then they, they cancel each other out, hopefully, because you get enough of them. I mean, that's, that's, that's the law of large numbers, is you get enough samples and it, everybody's stuff works out. But I'm hearing much more need for longer engagement and conversation, less input from us. That's, that's good, that's really useful to me. I think the uh, I think Kevin no when I, I was kind of stuck in the weeds was uh, you do it what I was kind of stuck in the weeds but I don't know somebody came up maybe it was you who kind of said no no we're talking vision here <laughs> so I think that was very helpful to have a facilitator say look you know when you're talking twenty years out don't don't get stuck in the weeds yeah okay all right let's go through some of these and but and. Discussion is, entertain is available. If you've got comments on somebody else's stuff, let's hear it, because that's part of what we want to get here. We do want to get through these, so we've got a few minutes at the end to kind of hit some of those big summary things that you want to offer right at the end to, that'll capture the whole evening in one sentence. This is team two. Yep. So uh, group two, we talked about workforce. Uh, we came up with a lot, of, a lot of ideas. None of you can read my handwriting. So I'll, I'll be real quick. 
public, these were the problems, public transportation, uh, drugs, s lack of support for childcare, uh, poorly trained workforce, young professionals don't have a connection, low wages and benefits. Then we, we talked about some of the uh, vision things, a vibrant economic center, and that seemed to begin to emerge out as a common theme among our group. Uh, we talked about uh, more people living close together, so that fed into that theme. We talked about a regulatory environment being more consistent and reliable, and it would balance the three of, uh, we had eco economic development, we had social justice, and uh, we had environment, and we're looking at a regulatory environment that balances uh, all of those three. And uh, then we begin to talk about how do we get there? How do we go from what we're seeing to where we want to go? So we talked about branding, and we, we talked about creating a regional brand. So for example, Lamoille County regional brand. And in that brand, there would be uh, different facets of what makes the county the county. We looked at grant opportunities as a way of raising money to do that. Uh, there was concern about Act 250, overhaul Act 250, and um, let's see, again, fair regulatory environment, and uh, more emphasis on higher education in, in the tech school, better connection with the community, with businesses. So more job-related kind of training activities, internships, part-time jobs, things like that. So then we, we, uh, we kind of wound up with a theme. And I kind of said, can we come to a theme? And it, you know, this is a group where everybody's got a different opinion. Youth empowerment was a theme. Uh, centers for vibrant for youth, a thriving place where youth could come and there would be empowerment in an environment, ex exciting, vibrant environment. So that was ours. Does anybody want to uh, talk about Jim's before we move on? in particular, or we can just present and then we can generally talk. All right, great. We're group number three, and I gotta say I'm a little, uh, I'm a little shameful here because Jim was, must have been writing about a mile a minute, uh, which, is, uh, which is great though. Uh, we had an awesome conversation. We were talking about quality of place, infrastructure, um, and investment, and we talked uh, a lot about the different challenges in living in the area. We talked about, um, much like you did, about people congregating in, um, in um, tight-knit communities. We talked about whether, you know, how some people move here not to do that, but some people do. We talked a lot about the challenges with communication, broadband, those sorts of things that are uh, holding people back. Um, we talked quite a bit about transportation, the mobility of people, how it's a, it's a big challenge, it's a big economic challenge for people where they can take jobs, where they're able to take jobs, um, their proximity to jobs. <clears throat> we tried to look at you know what a vision for the future of transportation might look like, whether it's utilizing car share or some types of public infrastructure for transportation. How do you solve that? Um, we talked, uh, again, we talked about telecommunication. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about how you know we've just, it's you know we've been mired in it for the last ten or fifteen years, and it's just a it's a huge challenge. But uh, nonetheless, you know, of a, a strong vision for Vermont in the future is you know it's a must. You know, it's not a can we have this or should we have this. It's we must have this. I think we all kind of agreed on that. Um, we talked about the need for wastewater treatment. Um, you know, we're seeing down in the southern colonies is a big deal about pollution right now, and, and uh, it's, it's a huge challenge in our communities and, and lots of others that, that we need to keep, um, keep going back and trying to tackle for small communities. Um, we talked about, uh, let's see here, energy a little bit, energy efficiency, um, building out <clears throat> infrastructure for energy. Um, we had a lot, of, uh, a lot of differing ideas in our group, and I think we talked through a lot of things and had a hard time getting at times to uh, a place where you know we had one vision for what we could be because there's so many options and there's a whole lot of balance between um, you know kind of what we'd like to do and and what we maybe can do um, and lastly I think we talked a lot about um, the preservation of uh, our agricultural land the value of that land and uh, trying to find a balance between um, between what we do with our agricultural land and uh, you know 
utilizing it both for agriculture but also for other purposes and, and finding that balance. That was it for group number three. Okay, the first thing that, uh, that my group wanted to make clear to everyone is that this by no means represented consensus. Okay. <laughs> there was lots of, of the diverse conversation on a number of different areas. We did reach some consensus at the end, however, pretty much for the vision statement. But we, we kind of covered a few questions. First question we covered, by the, this was economic activity, innovation, and entrepreneurship, okay? So where's the money going to come from? Well, possibility of establishing a state bank within the, within the state of Vermont. Alternative currencies or means of exchange to store value. Things like mi increased micro lending through revolving loan funds that are set up uh, around the state. Uh, human assets new technologies, angel investors, funding sources like GoFundMe or Indiegogo or some of the other ones that are around these days, um, community development activities, CSA-type operations, increased exports, educational opportunities, money stays here through new technology. All good goals. So what sectors are going to be big? in the state in 10 or 20 years. We talked about high tech, particularly high tech as, re, as it relates to the internet. Travel and tourism is gonna to continue to grow in the state. Healthcare is going to be growing. Specialty food and beverage production. Uh, manufacturing will continue to be a force in the, source, in the state, it still is. Um, higher ed, renewable energy, and the b building trades. The creative economy, and that doesn't just mean things like what you typically think of when you think of creative economy. It also includes people who work at home doing website development, uh, people who work at home as graphic designers, uh, people who are writing code, not necessarily by going into Burlington to do it. Um, online services and product sales, things like um, uh, Airbnb, uh, along, things along those lines. What kind of jobs are there going to be? There'll be more technology jobs, more jobs in, in the allied health professions, uh, more jobs in elder care, certainly. Isn't, we're really glad about that, aren't we, Max? <laughs> At least I'm glad. Um, Home-based internet businesses. Again, increased building trades to create those housing we need for those 12,000 people every year. Skilled and affordable jobs in child care. Food production jobs. Food production is always going to be big. And last but not least, our vision statement we came up with was Vermonters have good paying, satisfying jobs with new opportunities presenting themselves for the next generation. Like I said, there was no consensus. Does this not cover broadly prosperity? You want to add that? <laughs> we'll make a note. We're going to do that right now. So, RT, let's take one of these and just grab a marker and I'll put that the So, what we wanted to do was exactly what just came out was, okay, what are we missing? Broadly shared prosperity, right? Guaranteed income. Now, wait a second. <laughs> Who's guaranteeing what to whom? Hey, are you kind of money? <laughs> so what I'm looking for is what jumps out at we got just a few minutes. What jumps out at you that was either missed that you want to make sure we heard that occurred to you once you heard some of these and said, oh, wait a minute, I missed this, or some big statement that says this wraps it all up for the whole thing. So let me start with Ralph in the back. Okay, matching job skills for those 12,000 plus and matching the educational development to create those skills. Okay, so matching educational development to job skills. I think that's, that's something the state colleges are deeply committed to doing right now, putting a lot of resource into. There's a specific term that I didn't hear, uh, education and lesson in recreation, or travel and tourism, but recreation because it's both a driver of our tourism, but also a lifestyle and a certain reason for people 
Okay. Nice. Thank you. I don't know how the same thing because I I have not so this is news to me anybody What do we have that would attract that investment? Is that what we want? And what does that mean to Vermont? Why are people thinking? So there's two things. What are they thinking, and what do? What's our response to that? Right. So there's a conversation here. I mean, yeah. Well, they get twelve thousand a year. That's one year, anyway. But you, but you want them all in one place at one time is part of the question. I, I was. I was hope, hope, kind of hoping there'd be 100 in Brattleboro and a couple hundred in Bennington and, you know, 50 in Johnson and 1,000 or 2,000 in Burlington. That's what I was thinking, but clearly these guys are thinking something different. But they're not the first to do that. What about the 12 tribes? 12 tribes have been here. I don't think they've got 15,000 in the state. That, that does trigger uh, uh, something I think is missing, that we probably take for granted, and that's our civility and decency. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Decency and civility, as as just as 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 central cultural values, right? Yeah. You, you yeah. Think of why do people come here? And I and I, but I also think that's one of the things we want to keep. We want to preserve because that's what, um, in addition to the vistas and the recreation, decency, civility, and fairness are some of the things that are really important to almost all Vermonters. We may have slightly different reasons for what that what it is or different definitions, but we can say no. I. I I want to be fair with my neighbors. Yes, sorry. Something, I'm not quite sure how to apply this, but something I keep coming back to is um, an expansion of our concept of a working landscape. And related to that, an evolution of our aesthetic related to the working landscape. If you think about renewable energy and some of these technological components, I think that's a piece of the picture that and I'm not not sure where you're going with that. What do you? Cause, partly because Jared's here who works on working lands, but what is that? What are you after? So uh, recently, I've been talking to a bunch of young people who have said, "Well, you know, when we think about Vermont, we have this certain aesthetic in mind, yes. but the future of our state is going to require an evolution of that aesthetic." That. Thank you. But do you have a picture of what that is yet, or are you just saying we need to get there? What? <laughs> right. There, there are a couple of unifying themes here. I'm, I don't know if other people are picking up on it too. One was the, um, the centers, like innovation centers, incubators, concentrated centers, where there is existing broadband and all of that kind of stuff. But it also comes up with the, the youth centers. So that's one thing that I'm seeing that's unifying. And the other, the other thing I saw of importance was uh, um, maintaining agriculture and maybe promoting the technology behind agriculture to make it uh, more accessible in a more efficient way. And that's, that's an area to look at also. But I, I, I think uh, she was going in a slightly different direction in terms of how, how the notion of a working landscape in the mid 21st century or what, what a working landscape in the mid 21st century looks like. And we don't know what that is yet. We know what it used to be. We don't know what it will be. I mean, how do you build agriculture production, value-added agriculture production facilities or small factories in a way that are, that are, that integrate with our view of what this is, but still provide decent jobs for people? So it's a. Workforce to be productive. So what was Public it? Health. Chronic. Chronic disease prevention. Chronic disease prevention. We actually do pretty well in the moment, don't we? Yeah, we never do. 
pretty huh? well, but. Okay, no, so it's, it's something, that's one of those things we want to continue to do. Yes, issue, the issue, the recent issue of all of those, yeah. Okay. The part of it is your environment. Yep. Access to how the Just apropos of Europe, some of that access to health care, so adequate health care services and facilities, which is a challenge because of the resources, raw resources. I mean, think, think about that. If we were in Mississippi, we would be having a very different conversation about public health. It would be a, it would be a different priority, a much higher priority, really, because there, are, there are, are issues that need to be grappled with right now. Anybody else? Yes. Well, it did occur to me to start talking about civility and fairness. Diversity, thank you, yes. If there is one single challenge that Vermont has to face in the next 10 or 15 years, it is diversity, has to. Uh, because there's no, there's frankly no other source of population growth for Vermont other than uh, immigrants and uh, persons of other races, colors, cultures. That's the way, that's the way most communities the U.S. are growing, it's the way Vermont's going to grow. It's just, that's, and we have to learn how to tolerate that. We have to teach ourselves because we don't know that now. We're all good, decent, fair people, but we've not had to practice diversity in the way that we were going to have to, I think. That's the point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Celebrate. What? Celebrate. Thank you. Thank you. But I think that's one of the crucial development, value development. I've not gathered for anything other than from Cheryl over in this side. No ideas over here. Well, I, well, one thing I think. Of, Go ahead. One thing I think about is uh, you mentioned that Vermont does quite well in terms of supporting small business growth and development. Fifty percent success rate after five years, yep. if you will. Yep. So I, I, I'm aware that there's there's a lot of work being done around um, this notion of entrepreneurship and helping people bring ideas to fruition. I, I think that's a major piece of that um, in terms of our future. Yep. Yep. Continuing building that up even more, supporting that idea. I, I think so, but if the truth be told, most new jobs are created by existing businesses. So while we're supporting entrepreneurship and the creation of new businesses, we have to similarly support the innovation activities of our existing employers and support both supplying workforce to them and supporting their innovation activities. Then, then another thing um, that might offer as well is, you mentioned GS Precision, roughly 300 employees or so. Yeah. I wonder if there could be greater emphasis on supporting those businesses 25, 50 to go to the next level, if you will, so. That, that is a crucial stage of development for companies. When they hit 25 to 30, there's, a, there's, a, there's an inflection point where, they, where they, they are about ready to grow and they need help because many of them are at the limit of their, in, of their, in, of their entrepreneurial skills and now they need real professional management and we need, you need to help them do that. So that is, a, that is a crucial development thing for Vermont, getting businesses beyond 25 to 50. Really, really important. Any other wrap-up comments? Thank you all very much. As I told President Collins, I think we're done. We're going to cancel the other workshops because all the answers have been found here. Uh, no, the engagement was terrific. I, you were all great. I, I thank you for your comments about the process. We will adjust that, allow a little more time for discussion, although I am brilliant and I love to talk. But I can do that at home on my own. I don't need to be in front of people. So. The next forums that are scheduled are in Middlebury at 10.30 in the morning at the college, at 5.30 in the afternoon in Rutland on the 21st. No, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon in Rutland on the 21st, at 5.30 on the 28th in the Mad River Valley, at the Round Barn. On the, I think this, is, this one is still floating a little bit on the 16th of May at Champlain College. And we are currently working on scheduling Franklin County, Washington County, Bennington County, Windsor County, and Orange County. Can you account for that people We would love to. We would love to. Um, as, as Jennifer says, my, my business partner says frequently and rightly, 
the most important people at any meeting are the ones who aren't there. You know, so that's a question. Who, 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 was, who did not come out that, whose voice we need to hear? And we try really hard. In most of the places where there's a young professional group, we reach out directly to them and try and get them to, to send people. Or in some cases, we've gone and met directly with those young professional groups. But yes, more young people. Why do you need to hear from me? I'm 71. You know, I need to hear from somebody who's 30 about what to do here. Yeah. So related to that, I just thought this, and I don't know how this would be done logistically, but I wonder about bringing some of these questions into, into some of the local schools, juniors, seniors, you know, the people that are the cusp. So anyway, you yeah. probably thought of that, but nope. I don't know how that could be pulled off, but it's good to be reminded. You know, th that's where they are, and you have a captive audience, if you will. So, yep. anyway. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us. I appreciate that. President Collins, thank you for having us. We appreciate it. And hopefully we've got your email address and you'll hear from us at a later time. And when we get the, a vision developed, you will see it. And hopefully you can say, I was there and I helped build this. So we'll be in touch. Thank you very much.